Mo friends, the past few weeks when I was building this World War I diorama were all leading up to this point. This scene is representing a British Mark IV tank that was stuck in a shell crater, then shot up by Germans, and then it was just flooded with rainwater. I've got everything ready. The groundwork is painted, the tank is fully weathered. This leaves us with the single element that's gonna make or break this diorama, epoxy resin water. And it's gonna be the first time I'm working with this material in such a large quantity, so wish me luck. The first task is waterproofing the base and creating a dam for the epoxy. I already sanded the wooden sides so they'll provide a better grip for the tape. As for the dam, um, tape. <laughs> I've got Tamiya masking tape and some double-sided tape which is sturdier. However, it has a visible texture on the adhesive side and that's not cool. So Tamiya tape it is. I tried to apply it as evenly as possible, stretching the tape so it wouldn't make funny shapes. To make sure it was glued perfectly to the base, I used a Dremel butane torch. The heat reactivates the adhesive, making it stickier for a short while, and this way I think it'll form a more waterproof bond. And to be on the extra sure side, I also added the double-sided tape because it's very sticky, and thus it should act as a safety net if there's any leakage. Okay, so far so good. When you're making something you're unfamiliar with, even the basics are important. Let's now waterproof the bottom of the shell crater with steel water. And while we're at it, let's glue the tank permanently in place. With water. It's a clear acrylic gel that supposedly works really well for small puddles, creeks or any body of water that's not very deep. It's water-based and thus it's safe to use if your diorama is made from styrofoam. I wouldn't be very stoked if the epoxy resin water started eating through my diorama like some molten reactor core in Chernobyl. <laughs> Also, the bottom of the crater is made from a slightly porous, lightweight putty, so this should prevent any air bubbles in the resin. Last but not least, it seals the contact point between the base and the tape. Before I can start pouring the resin, I need to add some barbed wire. I placed the entire thread in the upper lid of my wet palette and gave it a bath in VMS Black Track Pro. I think I had to leave it there for about half an hour until everything was nice and dark, and once I washed it in soapy water, the result was fairly realistic with very little to no effort. Now I could fix individual lengths to the base, attaching them properly through the pigtail anchor points. I wasn't fully happy with the burnished dark color, it was uh, a bit shiny for my taste, so I quickly gave it a coat of dark grey acrylic paint followed up by a rusty enamel wash. Not 100% authentic, but it's a nice touch. And now I could start pouring the resin. I wanted to play safe, so I went with something I knew would work as intended. The instructions are clear and, in fact, very simple. It's just about mixing the resin and hardener in a 2 to 1 ratio using syringes, which are included. Um, spoiler, they're not. Luckily, I have my own, but they don't fit inside. Well, we're gonna do it the old school method, by guesstimating. Roughly half a bottle of hardener and roughly a half a bottle of resin. I wasn't even sure how much I'd need for the entire diorama, but I didn't want any of the precious resin going to waste, not to mention I wanted to pour it in at least two separate layers. I'm gonna add a nice murky color with Tamiya khaki acrylic paint because I think it matches my inspiration from 1917 pretty well. Again, I had no idea what I was doing, so I wasn't sure how much paint would be too much and how much would be not enough, so I kept adding more, two drops at a time, until I felt like I achieved the right murkiness. And now for the main event. Pouring the resin and watching it slowly spread over the surface was, um, terrifying at first. All I was thinking was, if something goes south now, there's no coming back. But at least I'd have it captured on video so everyone could laugh at me, right? Well, from what I've seen, resin is very viscous and it'll creep up anything it touches. 
So I poured it in small quantities, creating these small pools all across the crater. I didn't want to mess up the groundwork, or even worse, the tank. There was a lot of surface tension and the resin would simply, you know, beat up and go no further. So it needed a little nudge, quite literally. I pushed it against the shore with an old airbrush needle, covering the entire surface in a thin but very even layer. This way I was sure everything was flooded properly and I could continue without too much hassle. Now I could pour the remaining resin without worries because it would now spread homogeneously. Well, gotta say I was petrified at first, but at this point my stoke levels were through the roof and there was something else I was looking forward to even more. There were a few small bubbles and these would look awful in the finished scene. But if there's anything I learned from Luke Toen, it's that air bubbles can be obliterated with a blowtorch. Not only is the process satisfying, because it makes you feel like a professional, but more importantly, it gives you very professional results. Because what we have achieved is a beautiful, glass-like, spotless surface. Before I could leave it to cure, I made sure the diorama was sitting on a level surface. Luckily, my workbench is perfectly level in all directions. So I just had to protect the resin from collecting dust, and I left the diorama to sit overnight. Okay, the moment of truth, my friends. And look at that, it's a thing of beauty. It's recommended to leave the resin cure for 24 hours, and I left it for maybe 14 or 16, but the surface is hard like glass, so we can continue working. But first, a little bit of self-criticism. I should have definitely added more paint and make the resin more opaque, because we can still see where the tank was cut in half. That's something I didn't keep in mind, but again, that's what happens when you lack experience. Also, the water level is only about 3 mm tall, and I was getting worried I wouldn't have enough resin, so in the meantime I bought another bigger package. And guess what? This one comes with those syringes. Anyway, let's repeat the same process, but this time it's gonna be easier. I used the remaining resin and hardener, mixed them together carefully, and added the khaki paint. Six drops this time, to make the top layer even more translucent. It's worth testing beforehand which paints can be mixed with your resin. In my case, Vallejo didn't work, neither did heavy mud enamels from ammo, and regular enamels from AK changed to a slightly different color. Pigment powders would work perfectly, and Tamiya acrylics worked just as well. I was expecting the second pour to be much easier, but little did I know the surface tension would return. Now, why would you pour resin in multiple layers? Well, maybe you want to make a gradient, starting with a completely opaque, murky water at the bottom, finishing with a clear layer on top. But more importantly, resin produces heat when it cures. And too much resin equals too much heat. Again, it would be Chernobyl 2.0, but this time with epoxy resin instead of corium. Before I set the diorama to cure for the second time, I added the floating flimsy cans. Not gonna lie, it was quite fun watching them sink slowly into the body substance. <laughs> okay, that's it for today. Sweet dreams, my epoxy child. Well, good morning, my resin creation. Let's see. I mean, there's nothing to see. It looks the same as the other day, just rock hard. But you know what? That's a sign of a successful pour, when nothing went south and the resin looks just as it did in its liquid state. I absolutely love the glass-like finish. It's super satisfying. I was ever so slightly worried there would be some minor leakage, and it wouldn't be fun trying to fix or hide it, but luckily, as I was hoping, good preparation leads to good results. Absolutely nothing, zero resin went through that Tamiya tape. As I said, resin crawls up everything, and it left this raised lip against the tape. Luckily, it can be rectified with a very unpleasant process. It can be sheared with a hobby knife, and none of it feels right as you're just, you know, destroying that beautiful mirror finish. 
Luckily, the cut can be easily hidden with a quick coat of clear varnish. And while I had it at hand, I also brushed it on the sides, hiding the remaining tape residue and making them clearer. Let's now destroy that beautiful smooth surface with water gel. I wanted a relatively calm water surface, ever so slightly disturbed by a faint breeze. Something like on my inspirational photo, in fact. There are many ways to apply this translucent gel, and for my purposes, creating long, irregular lines with a paintbrush seemed like the best choice. It starts drying surprisingly fast, and it becomes hard to manipulate in roughly... 5 minutes, so if you have a large surface like this, it's better to work in sections. And if you're working in sections, the results might not look very authentic at first. I was especially concerned with some very obvious brush strokes on the surface, so I decided to give it another layer. Once again, I applied it in the same manner, but this time I was more focused on fixing the ugly areas, because most of the texture was already there. The thicker the gel is, the longer it takes to fully cure. Most of it was becoming translucent by the point I was done, but a few spots would definitely take a while. So I just set it aside for the third and final time. First thing in the morning, I was met with a beautifully rippled water surface. Let's not waste too much time and give it even more texture, okay? I wanted to add some floating debris for two reasons. One, it's a battlefield, so there's constantly something exploding and flying through the air. Dry grass, tree bark, whatever that would float on water. And two, I could use it to at least partially obscure the visible cut on the tank. I fixed it with still water, knowing it would dry to the same super glossy finish as the water gel or the resin. And I made sure to blend the edges with tap water, so there wouldn't be a visible step, so to say, where I applied it. Gotta be honest, at this point, I felt pretty miserable, because I pretty much ruined the entire diorama. I got carried away, added too much debris, and its color didn't match the groundwork at all. At first, I wanted to accept it as another mistake caused by lack of experience, but then I decided to treat it the same way as I treated the groundwork, painting every individual piece in grayish, brown, desaturated tones. It wasn't the most enjoyable process in the world, but I could see how it would improve the overall look of the diorama, and that was the driving force that kept pushing me forward. While I was waiting for the resin and gel to dry, I didn't live a real life. Instead, I painted the figure. It's a resin World War I soldier from Black Dog, and it has a beautiful pose that fits my diorama perfectly, but the sculpting… Nah, it's a bit rough. Because of that, it wasn't such a joy to paint, even though I was looking forward to it. Long story short, I painted it using the black and white pre-shading, and the rest was carried out with glazes. I made a detailed video about this process not so long ago, so check it out if you want to know more. So yeah, I just had to fix the soldier in place with super glue, and that was like the final cherry on top of this muddy cake. Well, not really, because the final cherry was painting the sides in a nice, thick, very opaque, very flat coat of Tamiya flat black, giving the whole scene a more presentable look. And yeah, that's it, my friends. When I started building this diorama, my expectations were not very high. At the very best, I was hoping to capture some catastrophic failure of biblical proportions on video, I don't know, flooding my workbench with leaking resin or whatever. But instead, I've got this gloomy, vintage diorama from World War I inspired by an actual historical photo. Pretty cool, huh? Not so bad for a first try, if I do say so myself. If you're afraid of resin water or some other diorama thing that's generally considered not easy, my best recommendation is to invest in some dedicated products from AK. I'm not trying to promote them or anything, I bought everything for this diorama with my own money, but they did a really good job creating this vast portfolio of high quality diorama products that work as they should. So, instead of worrying about your epoxy resin drying too fast or not drying at all, you as a modeler can focus on the creative aspect of this beautiful hobby and just you know, have some good time. 
at least that's my take after this experience. I'm pleasantly surprised, I had tons of fun creating this flooded crater, and I'm already thinking about another diorama where I could add some water. But until that happens, if that ever happens in the nearby future, I just want to say thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful or at least interesting to watch. A special thank you goes to my patrons who make this show possible, and if you like my videos and want to see more from me, you'll find extra content on my Patreon page. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch and discuss things through DMs, comments and emails, you can watch one week early ad-free videos, I'm also posting these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution, and you can also download some small 3D models for your printing pleasure. And last but not least, some real life references and inspirations for dioramas, old buildings and sceneries. Alright my bros and bronets, I'll take a short break before we start a new project and until then you all stay safe, stay awesome, keep building those models of yours, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one, cheers!